So good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's uh, architectural photography webinar on cityscapes and modern, ar modern architecture with our master, Nigel Foster. Hi, Nigel. How are you? Hi, Jay. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you loud and clear. Which now. is more than we could a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> we just had a little bit of a technical panic, so we've got Nigel <laughs> joining us by the phone. I'm on the phone instead, yeah. I assured him that I can hear him loud and clear, so it shouldn't affect the presentation. Uh, guys, if you do have any questions, those, please pop us through the channel, and hopefully we've got our fingers crossed that uh, Nigel's phone battery will last for the presentation. <laughs> so we're not going to waste any time. We're going to get full on into the presentation. But obviously, Nigel, you know, you run just very quickly, though. Um, you know, you're, uh, and it's easy for me to say, but it's so true, and we get lots of great feedback. Your own uh, training courses through, obviously. I do indeed, yeah. Through, group, and, individual courses, uh, groups pretty much throughout the UK, um, and uh, from uh, one day to four or five days, so they're quite quite an extensive range. But I can, I'll, um, I'll mention a bit about them at the end. I can absolutely assure you that they're great value for money, and obviously we'll be sharing the information with you about how to get involved with Nigel on that way. Nigel, I'm going to give you the screen, so it's going to come over to you now, mate, and I'll let you know then that we can see everything nice and clear. So Good you stuff. should be getting the prompt now. Okay, so I click show my screen. Screen, yes, yeah. Please. Good stuff. And then I'll let you know once I can see everything. I'm seeing it in full screen mode, nice and clear, mate. So I'll go Lovely. quiet. Obviously, ask you. You feel free to prompt me for questions, and I'll ask them yep. where if we need to. It's all yours, pal. Okay, thanks, Jay. Hi, hi everybody. Um, good to uh, good to have you uh, here. Um, I think the last uh, webinar I did was oh gosh, best part of a year ago. So. Um, if you've uh, seen my webinars before, uh, they've largely been on um, uh, aspects of landscape photography. Um, this one's a bit of a diversion, uh, as is next week's. Um, it's a two-part uh, webinar on uh, photographing architecture, uh, cityscapes and architecture. Heavy emphasis on architecture, because I want to go a little uh, a bit away from uh, conventional uh, landscape work. I actually do quite a lot of architectural work as part of my uh, my um, my professional commissioned uh, work. Um, uh, Generally, it's more, there's more of that variety of work than in, than in landscape. So if anyone's, in, anyone's uh, particularly interested in architectural photography and perhaps doing architectural commissioned work, hopefully there's a few tips in, in this for you as well. Um, so um, I'm going to cover this in a number of uh, stages. Um, there's a, a brief content here which I'll, which I'll run through. Um, what I want to do is to, um, is to go from the large scale, in other words, cityscapes, down to small detail. And generally, when you're doing architectural work, there's a broad, there's a broad aspect to it. There's the wide view, and there's the close-up view, and there's the, 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 um, the, the architectural, the, the individual buildings themselves in between. Um, one of the things that I think uh, is important perhaps as much as anything in architectural photography is an understanding of architecture, architecture itself, actually putting your, your mind in the designer's eye and the designer's mindset. Um, generally, with most things photography, wildlife photography being a good example, um, the, the importance is actually the interest first. Most wildlife photographers are wildlife enthusiasts. Likewise, most good architectural photographers our architects. I actually come from an architectural background, so I suppose I'd like to think I can I can put my mind in the eye of the designer and bring out what they're thinking when they come up with the with the um, with, with the design for the building. And the job of a, of a photographer, effectively, is to interpret the uh, the building in the eye of the photographer and pull out the best of it, both in terms of the overall design and in terms of details. So it's a slightly different mindset to um, something like landscape photography, where you're probably more playing more with light, you're doing more with, um, with, with, with character and mood of the place. With architectural photography, it's much more of a disciplined process. So um, hopefully I'll give you an idea of that as we go through it. So um, the, average, the, the general structure of the uh, presentation is um, a little bit like in, you can read there. What I'll do at the end of each section, which is, I've done in previous webinars, is to um, have a little bit of a break, um, get Jay back in, and just ask if anyone's got any questions as we go through. Generally, it seems to work better than just asking a lot of questions at the end. So what I'm going to do is start off with, with the wide view, cityscapes. Um, so um, that one happens to be 
uh, St George's Tower, which is a, a pretty iconic tower in London. Um, I've got a number of examples of that particular building. I actually did that as part of the commission, so I've got a number of examples here. One thing I forgot to mention as well, at the end I've got a number of case studies which I'm going to use to illustrate particular aspects of, um, of, of architectural photography, um, uh, particular uh, obstacles or hurdles to be overcome, and particular techniques you might want to use. So we'll come, those, come to those at the end. Hopefully I'll type, time this about right. Um, uh, generally, um, I time them to be about an hour. Jay's asked me possibly to make it a little bit shorter, but let's see how I get on there. Right, okay, so um, a cityscape you're probably going to be, uh, going to be those of you who know London um, are going to be fairly familiar with it. By the way, in terms of uh, locations for architecture, generally a lot of my work's done in either London, Glasgow, Newcastle, uh, and a number from Cardiff as well, because primarily Cardiff is fairly, fairly close by. The others really, I think, are mainly because actually they've got probably some of the best architecture in the country. Um, so I tend to go to those, those, those other places primarily for that reason. Um, so uh, with a wide view, uh, a few things really. Um, high viewpoints, and they're actually quite difficult to achieve very often, um, particularly at the time of day when you want to go there. Um, needs a lot of planning. Both of these are taken in London. London's actually very difficult, unless you live and work in London, particularly work, where you can uh, get up one of these um, high-rise blocks. Actually, getting a high viewpoint is actually quite difficult. Uh, these are happen to be taken from the Tate Modern, which is an open gallery. Uh, that you can, um, it hasn't got any windows in the way, which a number of them do, uh, a number of them do have, which of course causes problems with reflections. Um, but uh, these are an open view. Downside is that you can't use a tripod, so um, you find yourself bumping up the ISO quite a lot, um, wedging the camera against anything you can find, and hoping for the best. Make sure when you do this kind of thing, though, and you often find that with high viewpoints, you will be having to handhold. Make sure you view the image at 100% in the back of the camera before you're happy with it. It's really easy to get something just a little bit, uh, a little bit of camera shake, particularly when shoot using the kind of shutter speeds that I used here. So that's actually really important. It's really easy to go think you've got a shot and find it's not quite sharp. So make sure you magnify it 100% on the back of the camera before you move on. Um, these are also panoramic photo merges as well. And it's really easy when you're moving the camera to move it at the wrong time. So be very careful when, when taking this kind of shot. I've tried to strike a balance on these between um, uh, keeping the ISO as low as I can and keeping a shutter speed as, uh, a, a, as, as, as short as I can manage given the available light. Doesn't matter about the open aperture. These are all distant shots, so depth of field isn't an issue. So therefore, I'm using the aperture wide open with all these shots to get as, as much light in as, uh, as I possibly can. Um, so that's the kind of process I go for. Generally, with these view, viewpoints, you'll have a number of different angles, and you'll find that you'll shoot in different way, places different, um, di uh, for, from different viewpoints, and you can get a variety of shots. Uh, these were actually taken on two separate occasions, by the way. One had a much better afterglow uh, at night, than the one uh, at the bottom, which had more cloud in the sky. So they were different in their own way. Um, these mirror image reflections. Now, one thing, the, uh, thing that both cities I mentioned, with the exception of Cardiff, they all have a river running through the center. Uh, both uh, London, Newcastle, and Glasgow all have a river. Um, Thames isn't so good because it doesn't, uh, it's never still, whereas the others are. So you'll find that somewhere like Glasgow and Newcastle are excellent for mirror, mirror image reflections. So uh, flat calm day, clearly. Um, wind, uh, really important. Haven't got the same, because generally you can use a tripod with these locations. You haven't got the same limitations as you have with the high viewpoints, where you're often more, more constricted. Firstly, in where you can take it from, and secondly, being able to use a tripod shouldn't be an issue on the riverside generally, although some, part, some parts of London are private property and they still don't like it. Um, so uh, yeah, look for a calm day, calm weather forecast. Um, you, those, a number of you might have remembered I did uh, a presentation on, on weather forecasting as well. And um, hopefully get the right day and you'll get a nice, uh, nice reflection in the water. You'll also find, see that a lot of these examples are, um, are taken at night. Generally, I find cities come into their own at night. So that's when I tend to do a lot of my cityscapes. For example, my, work, my workshops, I do tend to use for shorter days 
because then you can, you, you can utilize the dawn, dusk, and night hours more beneficially than in, in the longer days. So um, longer exposures, a um, couple of examples here. Uh, primarily to blur the water with these, not the sky. As you can tell, one is actually under clear sky, the one at Battersea Power Station. But primarily to get rid of the ripples on the water, it's generally a much, much better effect um, than, um, than a choppy, choppy water effect. Do make sure if, you, if, you're looking, if you're using a shutter speed of about 10 or 20 seconds, which generally is sufficient for the water, that you don't get ghosting in the sky. The skies generally work well if you use a very long exposure or a short one. Otherwise, you'll get a bit of movement in the sky, which generally doesn't work particularly well. Um, down to um, oh, a couple of things on color or black and white. Um, generally shooting color, um, which gives you the option. Um, I usually find a lot of my night photography and cityscapes are actually in, in, uh, in color, because color seems to me to be a vital ingredient of the shot. However, a lot of my individual buildings, and you'll see from the examples I'm going to show you, are actually in black and white because of the, uh, because of the, the, the nature of the tonal nature of the pictures that I take. And particularly using longer exposures, they tend to work well in black and white. And I'll um, demonstrate a number of uh, examples to you. Um, I happen to think this works well in both. The, uh, the sheen on the water and on the block works well, and also the very warm coloring works well in color as well. So this one, I think, works quite, uh, quite well. It's got a very prominent main building, so you can clearly see where the main focal point is uh, of the picture, and I took that as part of my uh, commission I did on, on St. George's Tower. Um, you probably, I've, I've tried to, uh, in most places, give a, either a location or a, um, uh, a technical, uh, a bit of technical detail, particularly long exposure um, images. It's useful to see um, what exposure I've used for them. This one was just over a minute, which again, enough to blow the water. Water's very smooth. Uh, there was absolutely no movement in the sky, as you can tell, very, very little cloud. So in fact, the long exposure really had no effect on that at all. Um, individual buildings, they can be tricky, big buildings in particular, both if they're wide and if they're tall. A um, couple of examples here. I've um, done a series of uh, commissions for engin an engineering company based in Cardiff. Those of you who know Cardiff, um, I imagine a number of you listening to this do, being, uh, being uh, Wales-based, um, is the Cardiff and Vale College, which was built about three years ago. And uh, the other one is a, um, uh, a block and a business park. Um, these were actually a panoramic photo merge. I've got a couple of examples later on of how, how these were achieved. But this gives a very, very wide wide angle of view gives effectively around 150 degrees, which almost goes almost back on yourself. You couldn't possibly take, uh, unless you had a fisher lens, which actually has all sorts of distortion, um, take these um, with, um, with a single shot. So they have to be a panoramic photo merge. Now I will, I'll talk about uh, more about photo merges with, a, with one of my case studies later on. So I'm not going to go into uh, to any more detail on that at the moment. So um, high buildings, they have other challenges as well, particularly in uh, very built up areas, you can't get far enough away. So um, a few um, tricks of the trade with that. You'll see as I go through uh, my uh, examples, I do a lot of shooting up to the sky. Um, you get some really interesting perspective effects doing that. Um, an example uh, on the left-hand side from um, Leadenhall Square. Leadenhall is where uh, the Lloyd's building is. Um, they are, in fact, you'll probably see the building on the uh, top left isn't even finished yet. Um, so um, there's all sorts of construction work going on there. So uh, that will close that angle on the top of the, um, the top of that building. Um, um, the Lloyd's building is just down the road from there. Most people go, go actually expecting just to photograph the Lloyd, Lloyd's building, but it's now surrounded by a lot of others, and it's actually well worth a visit. But an issue is you cannot get close enough to the buildings to effectively get a frontal view of them. So it's very much about perspective views. Um, the other one, it's St. George's Tower again, so I did that other one as part of the part of commission, um, decided to uh, use some, um, some uh, uh, light trails uh, to draw the eye into it, effectively use a creative perspective effect. Uh, portrait format gives you more height, 
particularly with a high building. Therefore, you can get you can get uh, more of the building in context because you can get closer to it. Um, and uh, with a landscape format, I'd really been struggling for um, struggling to get to, to get sufficient space around the building. Um, so, incidentally, when you're taking that kind of shot, look for a bus, not a car. They're higher. Therefore, you'll find lights at the top or coming down from the top rather than just low light. So um, wait for a bus to go past. Generally works much better. So um, Jay, that's the first section on uh, cityscapes. Has anyone at this stage got any questions? Uh, we do. Uh, some very simple ones, Nigel. One that we always get, and it's great that we've got it again, because that must be <laughs> okay. from, some new, uh, from some new audience members. Um, so one related to what we've talked about, but the first one really is just, to, I suppose we, 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 we take it for granted we've talked about it, that when you're out, especially obviously you're, you, you're here on location in London, as you said, on a commission, um, what's, what's usually uh, in the kit bag, you know, what, what kind of, sort of camera and lenses and tripods and so on? Um, take, take everything, uh, particularly in London, by the way, you can't, uh, it's not easy to have the car because um, <laughs> cars aren't very welcome in most of London. So generally you have to carry stuff with you. Often when I'm uh, out and about, I'll pile the stuff in the car and just take what I need. Generally, when you're around in London, you effectively, uh, particularly during the weekdays, not so bad at weekends and evenings, but during the weekdays, you pretty much have to take everything with you. So I will take um, a, uh, uh, a camera body. I will try and get in a spare because you don't want to uh, you don't want to don't want anything to happen not that it actually ever does not usually anyway um and uh, a range of lenses from a wide um i've got a 16 millimeter on a full frame through to a um uh, a telephoto up to about 200 generally with this architectural photography more often than not i'll be using the the wider lens and actually quite on quite a wide setting so the wide angle is possibly the most useful I'll take uh, neutral density and graduated filters, the neutral density filters if I want to do long exposures. Um, and obviously for that, I'll also, also take a tripod as well. Um, so essential, effectively it's down to essential kit. It's a basic range of um, neutral densities, neutral density and graduated neutral density filters. Uh, camera, but tech, possibly a spare body. Sometimes I try and get away without taking a spare because it's more heavy. Um, and um, three lenses, typically three to four lenses. I do have a perspective control lenses for vertical use, but it's not wide enough um, for a lot of my wide shots. So I end up using the standard wide end angle lens as well. So generally camera body, four lenses, tripod filters. Uh, following on from the tripod question then, um, what, uh, what are your, how do you feel about uh, a beanbag instead of a tripod? Uh, wouldn't be sufficient for long exposure work. Brilliant. Simply wouldn't, and you also can't get the you can't get the camera a sufficient height either. You haven't got enough flexibility on height. Really, does need a tripod. Do you often clone out things like uh, cranes and things like that in a big city? Oh scale? yeah, yeah, yeah. If they if they interfere, in fact, uh, it's interesting. Yeah, if anyone who knows London and goes there knows there's plenty of cranes around there. Um, if they interfere with the composition, and I feel, feel as though detract. Yes, in fact, uh, now somebody's mentioned that, and they might have been prompted to mention it because of one of my pictures there. There is, there was a crane sticking out of the top of that building, the unfinished building on the left-hand side. When that building's finished, I will actually go back and re-photograph this because it's actually quite in a strong composition. So, um, yeah, there was actually a crane on top of that building. If I'd really been meticulous, I'd have, I'd have uh, also cloned out the unfinished bits on the top as well, but I didn't bother doing that. Brilliant, mate. Um, I thought this was an interesting question, and uh, you, you're the right man to ask. So uh, somebody said that obviously the trend is for higher resolution sensors with like the Z7 being like 45 plus megapixels. Do you think mm. there's any advantage to this, or do you think you can still get a great result out of a 25 megapixel camera? Oh, I do you know, Jay. I'm not sure I am. An, I, I'm not sure I am an expert on this, really. Um, I, uh, I, I the, the, the clearly the, the, the larger sensors produce larger files. Um, they are uh, they take up more space. Uh, with some cameras, they can buffer. Um, you know, the, the processing takes a little bit longer. Um, I've got a an Nikon D800, which has got a 37 megapixel. In fact, a couple of clients have actually complained that my files are too big. Um, actually say, can I reduce the size a little bit, which kind of defeats the object, really. Um, so there is a tendency, certainly, for sensors to get bigger and bigger. 
Um, it really depends on the magnification. I did a commission a few years ago uh, for the NATO summit, which involved having uh, images 35 meters high by uh, wide by, 10, by 5 meters high. They were huge. Uh, and uh, my camera was definitely pushed to the limits. Should have possibly had a large format camera for that. But for most uses, to be honest with you, the kind of level that cameras have got to is even at billboard for billboard level is pretty. They're pretty. They're pretty good. But I, I, I wouldn't call myself an expert on this. To be oh, honest. Oh, but I think yeah. that's the re that's you know that's the real real you know the realistic answer about it. You know, we all all the way through the years we see these bigger. Uh, bigger sensors and stuff coming out, and I, I remember I can't remember what it was now, but somebody put a, um, I think it was a brand new Leica in Mike's ha Mark's hands in Sweden at some point, and then the image was incredible. But when we looked at the file size, it just simply wasn't, you know, a yeah, realistic, I know, you know, I know, and I, I, you know, I think there is a danger there, really. Um, yeah, that there does seem to be a race to the race to the biggest. Absolutely brilliant. So this is relating to working in London. Have you ever been moved on? Is it difficult to shoot in the likes of London? Do you find that an yep. issue? Yes, I've been moved on. Um, if you, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, um, the waterfront by the Thames, uh, I was moved on actually just on the steps in front of uh, Westminster Bridge. Uh, there's a little gate at the top, and uh, I was told not to use the tripod, and uh, I took the tripod away, and it still wasn't good enough uh, for him. Um, generally, uh, they don't, um, you know, most of the places I go to, I, I went, I was there this weekend actually, didn't, didn't, didn't have a problem at all. Um, I think if you, if you, um, if you're discreet, uh, and uh, you, um, you know, you, 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 you don't cause a hazard. It's not too bad. But there are one or two places, a private property, they simply will tell you off if you don't use a tripod. It's funny how these security guards seem to come from nowhere. You can't see many, any of them around. The moment you get a tripod out, they're, they're, they're there. I don't know where they come from. It's like they come out of thin air. I, I've been moved on a couple of times in London, but not yeah. <laughs> uh, n never really been nasty or anything about it. It's just no, they're not nasty or anything like that. It's just uh, but one's by the London Eye. Uh, so it was quite interesting, very popular, I guess, you know, it's a very popular touristy place. But uh, saying that, he just asked me to go back a bit and, and that was and it was OK. So it's sure. Yeah, it, it's just fine. Uh, the last one before we move on, uh, Nigel, do okay. you um, do you use any polarizing filters? I very rarely use a polarizer for architectural photography, only if I want to uh, bring out detail in reflective surfaces or I'm shooting behind glass. And I try not to shoot behind glass, to be honest with you, because you generally do get a degraded image. So I really, I truly try not to do it. When I have to, I will use a polarizer. I certainly never use a polarizer, polarizer when there's a blue sky because you get a patchy, patchy light effect in the middle, particularly on a wide angle lens. So don't use them on blue skies. Um, I sometimes, if it's rainy, I will use them on um, on wet ground, and it can bring about about more detail. But use your use. The, I would ask people to use the judgment on that because you can reduce the effect of the reflection as well. So if it's the reflection you're looking for, the polarizer actually might reduce the effect of it. It's often best to actually take one with and one one without, and actually cover yourself and see what you see which you prefer. Uh, brilliant, Nigel. Back to you, mate. Okay. Thank you. Right, I'm going to go on to um, more individual buildings now. This is this effectively is the whole building. So I've got a number of um, a number of uh, 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 headings here. Um, using perspective, I use this a lot. You probably totally can see from the examples before. Very strong, striking buildings. Using cloud movement, uh, using foreground, and that's in true fairly standard stuff. So you'll uh, hopefully most of you will be, be quite familiar with that. A couple of examples of how you balance composition. Now, tall buildings have a particular issue in themselves. Unless, uh, unless you find a way of balancing the composition, it could, it, they almost have the appearance of disappearing away from you. So, and there are, there are ways you can manage that. So we'll look at that as well. And finally, telephoto lens. Effectively, you're creating patterns by comp compressing perspective. So um, a few examples of this. Um, we'll just rec recognize the one in the middle again. Um, so using perspective, effectively what you're doing here is um, um, shooting up to the sky, effectively from below, and making use of the geometry and the lines of the building. Um, and they, they uh, obviously a wide angle lens has the effect of um, uh, the lines disappearing strongly away from the camera, um, um, creating a feeling of depth and distance, and really gives an impression of the height of the structure. So that's the advantage with, uh, with doing this kind of shot. Um, where you position yourself is quite important. Possibly, actually, that one in the middle there at the top, 
I did experiment with my positioning of that uh, quite a lot, and it would have been helpful in hindsight if I actually I had a slide which showed how I positioned myself to, to change the orientation. But instead, I went for one which actually created two quite strong linear uh, straightforward geometry in that I tried one using a diagonal I tried one emphasizing one of the angles compared to the other but experiment when you're doing these kind of things the one on the left in fact two or three of these use a strong diagonal in the image the one of the um, uh, Millennium Center in Cardiff the one in Hong Kong on the left on the right hand side on the left hand side of Becky Pardon and uh, the one uh, with the tree in it has used the strong diagonal I do set up diagonals quite regularly uh, in my architectural photography. It, it, it emphasizes, they generally emphasize the dynamism of the building. When I particularly like the one on the tree, I actually quite like the mix of, of nature and man-made structure. Um, but with, the, with, the, with the lines of the tree, the almost abstract graphic effect of the tree, but drawing the eye towards the, um, the, the almost the serrated edge of the building and uh, the strong perspective lines leading up into the sky. That was taken uh, just along, just down the road from the Shard, a place called Moor London. It's a uh, Moor London place. It's very effectively where that big development is at Hayes, um, Hayes Gallery, around that area. Um, um, you, can be, you can be stopped there, but uh, again, if you, don't, if you don't hang around too long for the tri with a tripod, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, so um, yeah, use perspective, I use it a lot. Um, because uh, so widest angle generally the widest angle lens I've got I've got a 1635 zoom lens but I'll play around with the zoom because you can zoom out too much and almost the the zenith the end point of the building disappears away from you so just experiment the rule with generally with most of these things is have a go at different settings uh, um, different focal lengths different positions orientate the camera differently um, 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 reposition yourself so the building angles change. Just, as I said, just experiment. Um, next one, cloud movement. Um, cloud movement suits um, the architectural photography very well. It creates very strong delineation between the hard edges of the buildings, particularly modern buildings, which have got very strong clean lines and um, of uh, the movement in the sky. You can often find that, um, that the detail in the sky, the cloud detail, can actually detract from the lines of the building, whereas smoothing it out really picks those lines out. I've got a couple of examples of that in my, um, my case studies um, at the end of the presentation. But in principle, I use cloud movement a lot. Generally, obviously depends, a couple of things on cloud movement, obviously depends uh, on the speed of the cloud, how long shutter speed you use, and you can overdo it. If you overdo it too much, you can find it all blurs into effectively a uniform gray. So be careful not to overdo it, and you'd be surprised how sometimes how quickly clouds move. So um, like before, experiment. But I typically tend to use anything between about 30 seconds and two minutes. That one at the Sage Center at Gateshead, though, was actually eight minutes. Um, very little cloud movement there, um, in fact, next to nothing. And actually, when it did, when I, what movement I did was actually worked quite, were, uh, actually worked quite well because it almost reflected in reverse the um, the lines of the, um, the the steps leading to the Sage Center, the one on the top right. So as a composition, it it, it, it worked quite strongly. Um, the uh, the others, the other thing about cloud movement, look at the direction of the movement. I try and use a cloud direction which complements the image. Now, if you look at the one on the top left, the Cardiff and Vale College one, I've used the wind direction, fortunately, with an alignment with the line of the main diagonal of the, the building. So it actually follows that line. Much more effective doing that, and effectively having a wind direction which doesn't complement the image. Um, likewise, the one on the River Tyne, you can see the clouds are coming towards me, the wind direction is coming towards me, which actually comes almost takes the eye away out from the middle of the frame. So, um, so think about wind direction as well. Um, and some some buildings, of course, you can uh, you can you can you photograph them from different different angles, so you can actually position yourself in in, in, a, in a place that suits the wind direction. So, two key two key things: look at the wind direction and its effect on the image, and also bear in mind the wind speed. And the kind of filtration you will see. All these build, uh, these images need a, uh, a strong neutral density filter. Generally, 
um, uh, between 10 and 14 stops, an indication um, that a 10 stop filter in broad daylight will turn a, 30, a 30th of a second exposure, something like F16 typically, into 30 seconds. That often isn't long enough. So 10 stops in themselves, and people refer to a big stopper filter, generic word, but people refer to it. But actually, it's not, it's not strong enough for a number of these images. Um, using foreground, um, fairly standard stuff. I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to dwell on this, um, because um, you'll all be pretty familiar with using foreground. But effectively, it's using a feature that, that acts as a base for the image and takes the eye to the main subject. So I've got a variety of uh, buildings and structures here that I've used foreground detail to act as a base for the picture. Um, and um, um, going over, over a couple of the examples, the one at Battersea Power Station hasn't in itself got, uh, got foreground, but the, the reflection in the water and the smoothing out of the color actually effectively creates the foreground. It still provides the same kind of base for the picture as many of the others do. Um, the one at the Sage has got strong lead-in lines, taking your eye into the shop and taking your eye into the building which almost seems to circulate around it, so it works quite effectively. The one at Pierhead Building in Cardiff, I know I talked about being modern architecture, I seem to have slipped in a very old building there, um, is, uh, is more about a paving pattern and a very strong uh, granite set pattern uh, in the frontage. And I found a flower to photograph to fill the foreground with the one in Swansea at the top. So um, um, I say it's fairly, fairly basic stuff for so anyone who's used to, familiar with um, uh, photographic composition. Um, Creating a balanced composition, this, is, this can be tricky. Um, this is an example from um, a development. Um, it's a halls of residence development uh, called Bagot Street, which is about a mile outside Birmingham City Centre. Um, and uh, you'll have seen a couple of slides ago, I used a black and white version of my preferred shot. Now, the common problem can be, if you look at the example on the bottom right, it's not very good. And you'll see an awful lot of buildings for people who perhaps are fairly new to architectural photography or photographing buildings, you'll see a lot of the images end up looking like that, where they'll point the camera towards the corner of the building and everything will disappear away from you with nothing to balance the composition. So the one at the bottom right is, is probably a, a first attempt. But if you explore a building, you'll be able to do better than that. Um, the one at the top right is a better effort where it's using the face of the building to take the up into the sky. It hasn't just got a corner, effectively a triangle, triangle in the base of the image. Um, it's using a much more stronger perspective effect to take the eye into the picture. However, it still lacks balance because all the image is on one side and there isn't really enough in that sky to balance the composition on the other side. What the other, the other two images do is use a building on the other side of the road to balance the composition so effectively you've got a shape on either side. Um, those of you who spend any time listening to my other presentations know I talk quite a lot about seeing imagery in terms of shape and form and not necessarily what your subject, what your subject is. So see these components of the picture in terms of shape and how you design them to create the effect, the effect that you're looking for. So what these other two examples um, do, one using a diagonal, the one in the middle of the um, slide, and one using straight lines, which actually on this occasion I prefer, even though I usually, I often go for diagonals, um, because effectively you've got, I've got one shape almost fitting into the other with the sky in between. And the long exposure has done very well in terms of picking out the, the shape of the buildings as well. Um, can be tricky. Those of you who have got a mirrorless camera or one of the newer cameras with articulated rear screen, screens, they're incredibly useful in this situation. Unfortunately, my old Nikons do not have that. And trying to um, put the camera on the, on the tripod and peer, put, stick it up, up in the air and peer underneath the camera can be very, very hard work. So those of you with, uh, with newer cameras, I've also got another mirrorless camera, which I use for my travel photography, which actually has got one. But those of you with newer cameras, actually the articulated screen is incredibly useful for this kind of shot. So essentially, um, don't just go for the obvious. Think about how you can um, um, work your way around the building, how you can um, look at it from different angles, 
and try and balance the composition rather than going for the obvious where everything seems to be disappearing away from the frame, which can be a real issue with a, with a, with a, with a very tall building. But tall buildings in themselves do have great opportunity as well. Um, panoramics. Um, I touched on this a minute ago. Now, some buildings and some developments don't have uh, sufficient, they're, they're too big for one lens. So um, you, uh, one way around it is to uh, use a panoramic photo merge. Now, these have got consequences. Uh, with most lenses, and apart from perspective control lenses, which actually keep, can keep lines straight, the inherent um, um, uh, uh, result of these kind of shots is to curve straight lines. Now, these might be okay, but they might not be okay. So think about that consequence when you're taking that kind of shot. Now, I chose this particular one because what it does is um, use the curved foreground feature to wrap around the composition, which actually works quite well. You've got to be really careful with your foreground with these kind of shots. You don't want a foreground disappearing out of the frame, and you don't want a foreground which, frankly, looks odd as part of a panorama. So generally, something which has got a natural curve on it will work very well, but you can see but the individual shots, the building has got a straight edge, but actually on the final shot, the panoramic, it's got a curve on it. Now, if you're doing commercial photography, in fact, my client on this didn't mind at all. I gave them the options of single shots, uh, which have the straight edges, or the curved shot and the panorama, and they didn't mind at all. They actually quite like the panoramas, but some people wouldn't, uh, because architecture can be quite a purist thing, um, so would, wouldn't like it at all. And there is no satisfactory way of, of correcting that curve once you've got it. Um, so um, keep an eye on the foreground. One other thing about using panoramics, I'm sure a number of you have done panoramics and are used to them, but full manual everything in terms of exposure, because you don't want the exposure changing uh, in response to light. Focusing, either use manual focus or if you're used to back button focusing, in other words, using, a, using the what they call the AF on button at the back, pressing that once and keeping the focusing, that's fine too. But don't use an autofocus, which will refocus every time you reposition the camera. Um, that doesn't work well in uh, in panoramas. Um, so uh, I'll probably do a, 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 a specific um, webinar in the future, actually, on, pan on creating panoramics. There's plenty, plenty in there. Um, so uh, composition created to start again, compression of perspective through telephoto lens. So most of the images I've shown you are, are using a wide angle, uh, but you can also pick out architectural detail and interesting juxtapositions, uh, juxtaposition of different, uh, different uh, uh, buildings through using a longer telephoto lens. Most of these are using about 200 millimeters. Um, um, so uh, it compresses perspective and creates quite strong, interesting patterns. It's quite useful to pick a building and just explore it and see how you can uh, create a pattern out of, um, uh, out of the shapes that you've got. Don't forget, everything you can see within these, they're all the intent of the architect. Mo mo most modern buildings are made out of glass and metal. Glass and metal reflect things, and they are very, very linear. They're very geometric, and they've got very strong uh, geometrical design. And what you're trying to do as a photographer is pick those features out, which are an intention of part of the, um, when, when, a, when an architect is using glass, sheet glass or glass cladding, part of the idea is that you reflect the surroundings in them to create a feeling of space and create interest in the facade as well. So that's part of the architect's thinking. So make sure that comes across in your photography and how you treat them. The one on the right simply juxtaposes, um, is actually the, um, the, um, the gherkin. Uh, in London, just juxtaposes an old uh, old church against it, so it brings it makes effectively. Even though the gherkin is massive in relation to it, it changes that relationship between the two. Uh, Jay, I've reached the end of the photographing individual buildings section. Uh, have you got uh, any other questions? Uh, actually, well, the questions that you had were about the long exposures, and I had them all round up, and then you answered the questions live. So excellent, <laughs> so, that's a good thing. Uh, which right. I have a feeling you did. So the only one okay. I'm quickly that I've kept, and I'm not sure if I'm asking it right because it's not. I'm not. But it's going right back to when we were talking about permissions and being moved on in London. Um, mm -hmm. do, do, um, and I think I'm reading it right because it's, it's not quite, I'm not sure if I'm reading it right now, but um, do you have to have particular permission to photograph the building? No, you're in a public space. 
you're it's in a different though, building. isn't it? If you're in the building, that's the different. Category. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, you would. Yes, uh, always. If you go, in, any, I occasionally go into buildings to photograph, and I will ask permission to do it. Yeah. Um, if it's a large public building, for example, I uh, I've got quite a few. I've got a, a few examples of, of the roof at King's Cross. Um, generally, won't bother there, and they don't mind. They don't mind at all. Most uh, public spaces like that, because they're still public spaces, but certainly any building which is private, absolutely, definitely always ask. Um, um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, enough, more, out, more out of courtesy, really, than anything, really. A photographer friend of mine posted today a picture of the King's Cross roof on Facebook. So, it's, you know, I, and, and I keep thinking, oh, I need to shoot it when I'm there. I got moved on once in Cardiff, actually, in the shopping centre. Um, yeah, shopping centre is difficult. They've got yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're very wary when you've got people in them. You can often get over that by um, obviously blurring people. But yes, uh, they're very uh, often you, you'll find security staff are very. Uh, well, I was looking back at the roof. I was looking up like you do, and it was in, yeah. it was a new building. But you know, he did ask me to move on, and he asked me to stop picking. I did. I respected it. Oh, well, even even handheld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even uh, handheld. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. But I did. I just moved on, and I did, and that's that. No, yeah, and that's yeah. it for now, mate. You crack on, pal. Okay, good. Right. Um, so, um, going from photographing whole buildings, um, what uh, the uh, the third aspect? So we've gone from cityscapes to photographing whole buildings. Now to more to more detail. What we're trying to do with this section is pick out the thinking of the architect, the designer, in terms of what they really want you to pick out from um, from from the building and what makes a building special. So um, modern buildings, as I mentioned, a lot of glass, a lot of metal structures. Generally, that they tend to be that combination. So they're great for reflective surfaces. They're great for strong geometry um, and uh, and an awful lot of interest. Now, the the the, the, um, the shot I've, show, I've shown here, I've just decided to use the number six. It's taken at six more London, which is part of London uh, that uh, area I was talking about, and use that. Um, as a strong feature on the bottom left hand side of the picture, almost using the thirds, takes the eye in, uh, using the uh, structure uh, on uh, diagonals. So diagonals are very dynamic, so it's picking out the dynamism of the building. But a lot of what you're seeing there are actual reflections as well. So what I've tried to do with that image is to capture the, a key element, which is the number of the building. So that's quite for, good for branding as well. Um, it's, uh, I've picked out the diagonals effectively the, the, the form of the structure, and I've picked out the reflection. So that's a building, or that kind of building, is really good just for, just for experimenting with different, different angles. Um, so the one on the right on this, actually, um, this one I've entitled this one, Reflections in Glass. Um, the one on the right is actually uh, the entrance door for the same building, that one there. So it's the entrance door for it, and it's quite interesting actually. The um, the uh, it's a revolving door, and the curved glass of the revolving revolving door um, almost looked like a building in itself. But what you can see, it also reflects other buildings and buildings in it too, and it creates a really interesting pattern from the um, the structure of the building itself. So um, picking out those kind of details is quite uh, is quite good. The uh, one at the top on the left, um, I've caught the whole of the building opposite uh, in the reflection of the building on one side. So you can see I've got virtually got a mirror image of it and held the camera as close as I possibly could to the facade of the building at the bottom, if that kind of makes sense. So it creates quite a strong abstract effect. If you remember the very first um, slide of the previous um, uh, as, sorry, uh, part of the presentation, the unfinished building. In fact, you can see there the crane, which I removed from the other one. Um, I quite like the crane in that, it's fine. Um, so um, that's the building I've got reflected in the front the side of the front. Put the camera as close as you can to the reflection. Be aware of where you're putting the camera because of the perspective lines coming from that facade, because that the, the, uh, what I, the way I've orientated is that I've taken the eye right towards the top of the building and effectively taken the eye, uh, eye towards where the building on the left finishes and the building of the right, the mirror Im image of the building of the, uh, on the right takes your eye into the frame. The two at the bottom are more about reflection of detail um, in, inside of structure. So the one the, on the right, the one with the red strips, are, um, is actually the roof structure reflected in glass. 
um, and uh, the one on the bottom, it's a mix at the bottom left, it's a mix of the facade outside the building, but also the, the window frontage as well. Um, so I've tried to, to, to encapsulate or incorporate all the components of the building in doing that. Um, but possibly the most interesting one is that one where, where that, what, that one at Leadenhall, um, uh, where I've caught out, I caught the, um, uh, the reflection of the building, the building's opposite. Um, the, these, these shots are quite high contrast. Be prepared to uh, underexpose potentially either bracket and HDR them because you'll find that there's a lot of light at the top with these kind of shots, but not much light at the bottom because effectively you're down in a, in a, in a, in a, a hollow with fairly low light. So unless you're very careful, you'll find yourself underexposing, dramatically underexposing the areas at the bottom or overexposing the area at the top. Um, so be prepared to do quite a lot of post-processing work. Make sure you protect the highlights of the bright bits and make sure that you have got enough detail in the lower parts to bring the detail back. I had to do quite a lot of that with this because effectively the original, if you saw the original raw file, very, very high contrast because there's much lower, less light at the bottom of these towers than there is at top. Um, interior design detailing, just some things you can pick out when you're, um, when you're, when you're walking around and having a look. Um, spiral staircases, a very traditional style of, um, uh, of, uh, of architecture. You'll find um, some beautiful spiral staircases in some books, two or three in London, which are, which are great. Um, this is a bit of a modern take on a spiral staircase used at Cardinal Vale College. But the same idea, try and think about uh, how you're going to photograph it using both the perspective lines created by the, um, the balustrading, the strong curve of the staircase itself. Um, the other two details, uh, one on the top left is a shopping center in Guildford. Um, and the reason I've chosen that one, it just picks out the, the, sim the emblem, the, the castle uh, symbol, which is used throughout the shopping center. So there's another element of branding in that. And a light, light cluster detail from uh, the one at the old business park as well. So it's something that the architect has clearly worked on and you just want to pick out through photography. Uh, the one on the bottom right, strong juxtaposition of different, uh, different forms really. I quite like the strong blue. The, the what, Cardiff and Vale one. Um, um, by the way, Cardiff and Vale did not have an issue with, at all with me. Uh, Jay asked me the question about um, about uh, photographing um, the um, uh, interiors and permissions. I, was, I did this for a commission actually, but they were more than happy if I <laughs> if I went photograph uh, went and photographed it anyway. So obviously some some don't seem to mind very much. Um, so um, um, uh, this one strong juxtaposition of the blue element, uh, main element, which is actually a staircase, um, and, uh, and the roof and other features as well. So it makes kind of in, uh, interesting ang angles uh, in that one picture. Um, roof structures, roofs can be great. Uh, that roof there on the top left is King's Cross Station. Uh, great design, and uh, I've got a separate uh, slide on uh, showing different angles of that. One of the top right is really fascinating. It's a convention, convention center, at ba uh, center at Basel, uh, and it's actually got a hole in it. So you, what you can see through the hole is the night sky. Uh, had to do a lot of work to bring back the detail on the night sky. It was, as you can imagine, in a city, a lot of light pollution. So actually did quite well in terms of getting that amount of detail back in it. But uh, the roof structure itself is fascinating. It was actually designed by uh, architects called Herzog and Muren, who are the people who designed the bird's nest in Beijing. Uh, the Olympic Stadium. And the final, the final one on the bottom is simply a wider view taken as a panoramic, and which was the only way I could capture the, um, the vaulted, uh, vaulted roof, roof profile, which was a requirement of the client, client I took it for. They wanted the whole roof, had to be done as a panorama, otherwise couldn't get, couldn't get the width with one shot. So it just shows that you can, um, that just with a bit of, uh, bit of flexibility, then um, you can, um, you can get, get quite a lot in. But the others are more about detail, and I'll come, I'll come back to the King's Cross one as well. Uh, cladding and external features, most modern buildings are cladded. Um, so um, see what you can pick out, just look around it and explore, see what you can find in terms of, um, in terms of just simple detailing on the um, outside. I've used a couple of these on a couple of occasions, other occasions. One thing I try and do, by the way, you'll, you'll notice I've used a number of pictures uh, uh, two or three times. They do illustrate different things, so it's quite important that, um, that um, you know, I've used the, the images to show uh, different aspects of photography. Uh, branding. Um, 
uh, all of these, apart from Newcastle United, one uh, were taken as part of commissions. I've never worked for Newcastle United, um, but just caught the idea off the gates. Um, you can see the use of perspective and diagonals quite along, and a strong main uh, main feature uh, using the um, company logo or the company name and that kind of thing. So um, again, think about angle, think about how you can orientate the camera. These are pretty much exclusively using wide angle lenses um, to get that uh, perspective from strong emphasis on the foreground detail of the name and then the perspective uh, taking your eye out of the distance. They're obviously all taking uh, 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 pointing the camera up to the sky as well. Creates a strong, uh, strong feeling of perspective and um, great feeling of depth in the image. Uh, right. Oh, I've reached the case, to case studies, Jay. Have you got any other um, any other questions? Uh, yes, only quickly. Um, I know we can, we can crack into those. Um, with regards to, well, we, I don't know if it was just particularly this section, but what um, what metering do you prefer? Is it spot, matrix, center, weighted? I I I shoot it entirely on manual, and oh, if I told you, I didn't usually bother even looking at my meter. <laughs> That's too, that's too experienced, though, nice. That's too experienced. Then, I mean, oh, gosh. Um, this is a really hard one. Um, um, I use, generally it's on matrix, um, and but I don't usually follow a meter anyway. I've got a reasonable, I suppose, from my point of view, a reasonable idea of what the light conditions are and generally give it, if I do look at the meter, I'll often bring it down a little bit, take a test shot, have a look at it, think that's all right, and that'll do. It's not the, it's not the technically correct way of doing things, um, but I know as long as I protect my highlights, and as long as I've got sufficient in terms of shadow detail, then I worry more about precision later on. That is not what I teach people, by the way, but what I do and what I teach are two completely different things. I think, um, I think from so, now on, um, it's long very time much, now, um, yeah, I can get away with that. From my own point of view, for I know what works for me. For a long time, you know, you know what you're doing, and I think that's... Yeah, yeah, so the question was, what do I do? That is what I do. <laughs> but I wouldn't... And, you, you know, if you've got experience, great. If you haven't, then, yeah, do spend a bit more time uh, time on it. Um, but, um, but one of the great things about using manual, um, aside from that, is that you can fine-tune. Much more difficult to fine-tune on any automatic mode, whether it's TV, AV, um, or any of the others. Um, uh, so, so that's Canon language, um, auto or shutter speed, um, other other cameras. Um, so um, uh, much that because what will happen there is the camera will always adjust and try and find a grey tone. So you've got much more chance of getting consistent results if you learn to use start, if you learn to use manual um, and and get much more consistent results. And you can also fine tune much more easily by just by changing one of the settings. So um, uh, with this kind of photography, when you've got, you're in a situation where you've got fixed, a fixed lighting level to shoot in manual, it doesn't help make life easy. And when you, once you've got the exposure set, pretty much you can use it throughout, but make sure you protect the highlights. If you blow the highlights, then you know, the, 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 the much more difficulty in terms of recovering it. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to get you to crack on. Uh, the, I've got a couple more questions, but they're general ones. That's so. fine. Yeah, this will only take about another t 10 minutes to get through these anyway, Jack. Right, pal, they're all yours. Okay. Right, the case study. So what I've tried to do is to um, pick on particular things that um, that might be of general interest. Um, though um, they, they, a lot of these are, are fairly run-of-the-mill pictures. They're just the kind of thing that I would take in terms of taking a variety of shots around a build, around an individual building, just to give myself give myself options. So firstly, um, this happens to be this uses the um, a residential student residential um, area in in Cardiff, um, and um, just think about the height you're taking it from. Now, very often, um, unless you're doing work as part of a commission, you won't have access to these buildings. You won't be able to get, get high up. So inevitably, they're going to be taken at ground level. Um, this is actually a private complex, so it's, uh, it's, well, you, it's, got, it's got a gated entrance anyway. But um, think about when you do uh, our photographing building, uh, building and can get at different heights, think about the impact on the perspective of the image in particular when shooting at different heights. Generally, from ground level, with tall buildings, you're going to be shooting up to the sky, and you're going to have to correct verticals quite significantly, because what they'll do is disappear away from the camera. So try and get those verticals straight again. Um, so I, the one on the top left there, 
I've simply chosen a, um, a position that I think draws the eye into the picture, effectively captures the, the feel of the, um, the, the housing complex. Um, and, uh, but the original has got, um, has got quite, quite strong uh, converging lines. So I've corrected that using the transform tool in Photoshop. And it works okay, I've got them pretty much straight. Um, the one on the left-hand side, um, that's halfway up. So as you're not pointing the camera up or down, you shouldn't need to correct verticals. The only thing you probably will need to correct is perspective, is, um, uh, is lens correction. Now, my lens in particular has quite a lot of barrel distortion. So if you, architectural lines, they have to be straight. If you've got a straight line, you really want it to be straight. And I know that my lens, particularly at the widest setting, has got quite a strong curve to it, which needs correcting. But if you use Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, it's got automatic lens correction for nearly all cameras. So um, some of the new mirrorless cameras are actually self-correcting, but the majority of cameras you will need to um, to correct uh, use lens correction uh, with, um, um, right at the outset when you're, doing, when you're doing the processing to make sure the verticals are straight. Um, finally, taken from high up, that will have the opposite effect because it will effectively spread the bottom out because you're pointing the camera down. So again, you'll have to correct. Um, I think for compositional balance, I think I probably would go for the one taken halfway up. Seems to work quite well in terms of um, a, a balanced composition. Um, or the one at the bottom, not so keen for the one, uh, the one um, high up looking down. A um, couple, uh, couple of examples, just um, uh, at ground level from the same complex. Um, Taken from virtually the same position, um, the one, what the two on the right, generally the the it, it, they look unbalanced. I've introduced clutter into the image with the bench uh, in particular, and actually the storage area as well on the left hand side. Um, but and the one uh, with the trees on the right, effectively the trees and the main part of the complex clash. So just going to the other side of the planting bed separates the tree, trees from the main facade because the other facade on the other side is actually secondary. So the, 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 the main through route through the structure places the trees on one side, the path taking the eye in, and, um, and the, it clears the facade of the building, so it clearly separates the two and gives the picture more depth. So there's no wrong or right about any of this, but just when you, when you see a location like this and you want to photograph a building, think about uh, where you're taking the shot from and just try different angles. Um, and sometimes you're never quite sure which one you're actually going to prefer until you get them back. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, getting uh, a balanced composition um, with tall buildings is extremely difficult. And the classic one, again, is the one where you've got this tower as the one in the bottom right just disappearing away from the camera. Um, so try different ways of, 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 of resolving that, or at least ameliorating the effects. Um, you, you can't, you can't, there's no other way of photographing them. Generally, with buildings like this, you can't get far enough away from them. So effectively, you'll find yourself having to use strong perspective lines, looking up to the sky, looking up to the building, either to capture the whole building, or, um, or unless you're photographing detail. So um, the one that doesn't really work, the one on the bottom right, so that kind of first attempt. But if you look at the two on the bottom, on the top, what I've done is use a diagonal of the name of the tower to counteract or counterbalance the, um, the direction of the main tower. So effectively, I've created balance by doing that. Um, the one on the top right, which frankly isn't as successful, but makes me make some attempt to, to address the issue, is to use a, use a building adjacent to the main tower and the starburst sun, but it doesn't work as well as the two on the left-hand side. It still has that effect of the whole building disappearing and leaning away from you, which rarely works well. Um, and the bottom, uh, the one on the bottom left, simply uses the planting area just to frame uh, the main tower. Um, I think of all of them, the one that seems to work uh, uh, most strongly is the one where I've used the name of the tower, one of St. George's, um, um, to, to balance the composition. Again, as I mentioned with earlier, uh, with, with, with the earlier one, no wrong or right about it. Just look around and explore and see what you can do to create some sort of balance in your compositions. Um, cloud cloud against uh, sta uh, movement against static cloud. You'll see I've got a couple of examples here taken at uh, Cardiff and Vale College. Um, and you, it quite clearly sees that actually that it shows that um, there's a much stronger 
um, emphasis on the building uh, profile and form with the longer exposures because the, 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 the clouds, and they were very light, light clouds as you can see. Um, you don't need big strong clouds to create, uh, create cloud movement. Um, often actually you'll okay, get some quite simple effects simply by white cloud against a blue sky because that in itself will, will create contrast. So it's all you need, particularly converted to black and white. I tend to convert most of my cloud movement shots to black and white. So you can see that effectively the, 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 cloud, move, the move, cloud movement ones pick out the lines of the building much more strongly. They tend not to clash with it. Um, hence, I use it quite a lot. Um, uh, with these, I think I, by and large, they were about two minutes exposure. But as I mentioned earlier, that will depend on the, depend on the, um, the wind speed. Um, oh, well, there's another one, the cloud movement is here. Same principle. Um, quite like this one, it's the shot I use for the cover shot for this section. Quite like this one because it shows perspective. It shows um, um, compositional balance by using the internal angle of the building. Now, most buildings have got external angles. They've you know, inherently got corners unless they're curved. And it's particularly when you're on the outside of the buildings, that can cause the imbalance where effectively you're, you're photographing the corner of the building, but there's nothing to balance it. This one has the advantage, advantage of having an internal courtyard. And what an internal courtyard will do will enable you to, uh, to photograph the angle inside the courtyard and therefore effectively get an angle on two sides, which makes it much more balanced. So if you see a building with a courtyard, have a look for opportunities like that, because generally, using a strong perspective shot, you'll get a much more balanced composition than on the outside of the building. Um, again, I've used cloud movement here, and you can see that the, the, um, both in black and white and color, the long, movement, uh, the long cloud movement uh, doesn't conflict uh, with the line of uh, the, for, the, the form of the building. Um, so uh, the rule is no wrong or right, just experiment. Um, this one, uh, panoramic photo merge, you can see the individual shots there, quite strong uh, distortion, which needs uh, correcting, uh, perspective needs correcting afterwards as well when they're merged. So the original unmerged merged version had quite strong uh, distorted lines, which um, you can fairly easily correct in uh, post-processing, so they were going into, into Photoshop and using the, uh, the transform tool. Um, King's Cross Station roof, there's the roof itself. It's a fantastic roof. Um, I think it was designed by Norman Foster, I think. Um, anyway, so uh, there's the roof itself um, and uh, some, uh, some details. Um, first time I went, funnily enough, they, I think they've added lighting to it. Because first time I went, um, the roof was kind of a, a neutrally brown color. But uh, second time I went, it was a nice, uh, nice purple color, pink purple, which is very nice. Um, so um, just a few examples, really picks out the shape of the roof. Just explore and experiment, really. Um, with shots everywhere with that kind of structure. It's a, try and find something which picks out, the, um, uh, picks out the detail, looks balanced. I quite like the one on the top left for that reason. Um, it's one that uh, creates a strong symmetry out of it. Um, so um, just, uh, just experiment. The, one, the black and white one in the middle, um, I, I very deliberately have the uh, main lattice structure of the roof going into the corners. Generally, that kind of shot it works much better if you got the, if you use the corners um, very precisely. Um, so uh, yeah, it picks up the picks up the shape of the roof very well. Um, right, and finally, just I think I'm just about done with this. Um, uh, just a note on lens correction. You can see uh, it's a time bridge. Um, the subject slightly immaterial, but you can see the uncorrected shot using. If you look at the, the uh, main tower on the left hand side, it's quite strongly curved lens correction will straighten it. So make sure when you use lens correction, make sure it's the first thing you do because it changes the other settings as well. Generally makes the images lighter. So it also changes the exposure. So make sure when you take it into post-processing, do this first. Why Lightroom has got this towards the bottom of the menu list, I don't know because it should be top because it should be the first thing you do. Um, so, um, and also you'll have an option for getting rid of or reducing chromatic aberration as well, which is that kind of color fringing effect you get on the edge, particularly on the edges of the frame at small apertures. So make sure you use that as well. So uh, there you go. There's the, uh, the um, interface on, on Lightroom. Uh, right, well, I seem to have reached the end. I have found somewhere to put one of my favorite shots, which is that roof in Basel. Um, so in summary, Try to encapsulate what I've just covered. Um, try and understand that some 
some understanding of, of architecture in itself and how buildings work and why they and but how and why they're designed. What's the essence of the architecture? What's the architect? What's what's the architect's mindset, and how you can interpret bring out, bring that out and interpret it through uh, through photography. So hopefully I've given you uh, an, a few ideas there, and I always put at the end of all my presentations and come on a workshop to learn much more. I hope you can. That's it, Jay. Brilliant night. Um, again. A fantastic uh, an hour spent with you. I love spending these uh, these hours with you. No, they're brilliant, but not just from me. I, I, I hand on heart, we've had lots of thanks and praise on the pres tonight's presentation already. Uh, Nigel, we're back next week. So you, you mentioned at the beginning, it's it's almost a bit of a two parter. And, yeah, it um, is. And somebody it's, also yeah, mentioned. Do you, in, to, in, do you want to explain a bit about it? Yeah. Uh, oh, did you have any more questions? By well, the way? we've got a couple of questions. We do, but um, I just, okay. got, just in case we uh, people might might tail off a little bit. Oh, uh, one sure. of the questions yeah, that right. came through was. Um, we've looked quite a lot of modern buildings, and that's pretty much what part two is, isn't it? Next week we're going back. It is. It's heritage. Part two is on photographing heritage. Different process, different design thinking on uh, photographing heritage than uh, the modern buildings. They aren't clean, clear lines. They have a different, uh, <laughs> slightly different approach to them, which hopefully I'll convey in next year's presentation. No, and that's year's perfect. And that, that was the question, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, looking mm -hmm. back, it's so uh, so perfect, uh, perfect. Line. Right, uh, there's a few, only a few questions. Nice, because you've asked that answered a ton as you go, as you normally do. Uh, well, let's get through these, mate. Um, so this was quite an interesting question. Do you feel with the architectural photography there is scope for stock library, and if that's the case? Do you need to get um, a, re a release, you know, a picture release for it? Uh, oh, 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 this is a tough one. Um, um, it really depends on uh, when you're when when you're photographing from a public space. The answer to that is no, you don't need a release. Obviously, when you're in a building, you do. Uh, when you're on private land, you do. National trusts, for example, are quite strict on this kind of thing. Um, um, as for stock, you need to have a lot of images to make stock work. Um, I, I don't photograph stock. I, it's just not my approach, really. Um, I, I tend to go for, uh, if it's not my commissioned work, for more of a sort of gallery work type, type approach rather than um, photographing, you know, every, every single post office in the country or something like that, <laughs> which tends to work quite well in stock. Um, so um, I, I'm not really the one to ask about it's, stock photography. It's interesting. People around who are much more informed than me. It's interesting that even stock photography and the, and the way that works now has changed so much. I apologize if you can hear the Christmas tunes. There's a car parked right outside yeah. with Maria Carey <laughs> blaring out. Uh, it should be passing. It could by. be worse. It could be worse, and it's getting, you know, it is Christmas at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> The stock photography thing is, is, has changed in a big way. You know, that a lot of the people who've taught for the Photography Academy over the years and a lot of our friends that I know just, you know, made a living in stock photography, it, it kind of all changed with, with social media. And I'm sure you know, even yeah. you know, Getty has its own Instagram now where you can upload your images and where in the past, it, you know, to be a Getty photographer was quite a task. And, and now, you know, they're looking mm -hmm. at Instagram and things like that. So, yeah, it's There's a, a lot of it around. An there awful is. lot. There is. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, very, it's yeah. a very different world on that. So, no, I have got portfolios on Alamy, Shutterstock, Rex Features, but I don't much make, make much out of them, if I'm being honest with you. No, I don't. Uh, this was, uh, I thought this was quite a good uh, question, Knight. Um, so, I love night photography, but as I get older, I get a bit weary of unsavory characters following me around. Nah. Um, any precautions or what, what's your advice? Oh, you know, keep the kit oh, to a minimum, I guess. I know, because you don't want to be keeping an eye on yeah, it. Yeah, I, um, uh, oh gosh. I, I'm, I, look, I'm not the one to ask. I'm as careless as they come. I'm awful. <laughs> I can, I can, because I've been out with I, you. I, you know, <laughs> I will leave my bag open in places where I know I shouldn't, because generally, if I'm in a workshop, for example, I'm trying to ju ju juggle between different people. Yeah. It's <laughs> I tend to be absolutely hopeless at it. I am not the one to ask. The advice that I'm I would awful give, at it. The I think, I yeah, give, the advice is, should be, you know, be, be aware at all times and keep all, all your um, your equipment on you, shouldn't it? But um, I, I wouldn't but, go um, on myself if I was that way. I'm not practicing while I'm preaching. That's for sure. No, if I was worried, I would I would go out. You know, you, I would I'd find a photography buddy or I'd join a camera club. Uh, you know, just put a Facebook shout out or mm. something, just saying anybody up for a night shoot, and j just don't go by. Or, or alternatively, also, I think you know, um, uh, oh, 
where do you find unfavorable unfavorable characters and perhaps avoid the kind of yeah, places that maybe that. you might come across them yeah. uh, have we got many no-go areas in this country i would certainly hope not well i'd hope not but you you just don't know do you it could happen anyway mm. Mm. So, yeah yeah i'm sorry we couldn't put a definitive answer but yeah i i i, I don't have one i'm afraid jay, jay no. no agreed uh, this was, I don't think this actually came up, and if it did, uh, apologies, you might have answered it already. Um, obviously, in a lot of the cases we looked at tonight where we were looking at, you know, uh, long uh, uh, and wide format images, but where we had sharpness uh, from front, you know, all the way through the image, um, do you yeah. have much sort of focus stack in? No, I rarely focus stack, actually, very, very rarely. Uh, generally use optimum aperture and option optimal positioning of single focus point. Um, so um, very occasionally I will blend two images. Uh, I put focus stacking, I, I really don't go into that, that element of trouble because generally if you do need to blend images, all you need to do, take the camera on a tripod, take one for the foreground, one for the background, put them together in, 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 in two layers. Don't need to focus stack for that kind of shot. Generally you'll only need two. Uh, but usually uh, in architectural photography in particular, your foreground's not close enough to worry about that too much if you're shooting at say the middle to high the middle um to um smaller apertures and you focus effectively in you know in the right kind of place which is you know people talk a third into the frame but it's it's significant out into the frame uh then um you've got decent depth of field with a wide angle lens clearly with a telephoto you do have to need to need to have to be more careful yes because if you've got uh, with a telephoto, if you've got a subject close to the, closer to the camera and a subject distance away, depth of field will absolutely definitely be an issue. But you d I don't find myself often doing that. Brilliant. Uh, I think you touched on this, uh, but in case we didn't, um, do you ever use a uh, tilt shift lens for exteriors? I have got one, and the problem I've got is um, I currently use Nikon. Now they are there. Uh, it isn't wide enough for a lot of the work I do. Uh, it's only a 24. I think they've recently bought out a, a wider one. Um, Canon, I think, do a 17. Um, so Canon users are actually better off um, because um, you've got a, a wider, I think may, maybe Nikon have recently bought out a 19 at some incredible price. Um, so um, I've got a 24, but I often find that actually I'm better off given particularly on type of space, particularly for interiors, for example, I'm better off using the wide and correcting the verticals because I've got more to work with. One of the advantages of using um, digital photography is that you've got other options as well. Brilliant. Uh, Nigel, with, with the questions are done, loads of praise through the panel. Um, uh, th and, and, and one of the, I love it as well, and, and they're right. Uh, great to be back because we, we, you know, we've been that busy that the webinars have fallen off a bit. And I promise you guys that, um, not just, not from Nigel, this is just from me and the academy. I promise you that my webinar program is stepping up lovely for the new year. But until yeah. then, we have Nigel. We've got Nigel every week. Uh, up until uh, we finish for Christmas. So as I said, we're back with uh, Heritage next week. And then before Christmas, we're doing Sunsets and Sunrise as well, isn't it? And you can mention to everybody, I've got 10% off my gift vouchers until until December the 22nd. Well, I haven't, but you just did. So 10% <laughs> off uh, Nigel's gift vouchers. So remember to get in touch with Nigel. Via Available the, for any workshop in the, in the next year. Absolutely. I'll make sure that you guys all have uh, the links appropriately to Nigel's yes. site and how to contact him. Nigel, from me to you, mate, uh, fantastic again. I, I've got to share this with you. Um, not a question, but a thank you, and one of many, uh, most inspiring, a lot of light bulb moments for this uh, for this relative novice. Uh, lots to learn, so thanks for that. And, and Excellent, that's, that's thank you for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Several times, uh, yeah, I could, to be honest, we'd be here another hour, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not joined. I love having you on board uh, because you, you are such a great teacher, and, I, and and you take quite a good picture. To be fair. Oh, thank you very much. That's all right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, mate, all right. You, thanks for tonight. Well, I was, we're back next Wednesday next week, isn't it? I believe. Uh, but, 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 oh, well, right. I'm, okay. Yeah. When is fine. <laughs> I'm pretty certain. I've got a slide. Let me check it. Let me swap slides. Let's just check now while we've still got on with us before we tell them something wrong. It can't be Tuesday because we've got our Christmas night out. So it's the 12th of December, guys. So I think that is that's, Wednesday. Yeah. That is Wednesday. Wednesday. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I think the week after, I could be wrong, Nigel, but I think the week after we're Tuesday. I think we're working our way back through the days of the week. <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> but, we're, but we're getting there. All right. Getting there. Guys, that's yeah. it for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Nigel, thanks. Thanks, mate. Um, we'll see you before next week. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And, uh, have a good one. I'm glad the phone held out as well, Nigel. We didn't have any problems, mate.